Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Charlotte has joined a short and exclusive list of major cities in this country that are host to national conventions for both the Democrats and the Republican Party within the span of 10 years. Welcome again to the most widely watched and the longest running source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I'm Chris William. Thank you for supporting this dialogue. Next summer, the Queen City will swell by approximately 50,000 temporary workers to stage, to showcase, to possibly protest, but certainly celebrate the apex of political conclaves. It is the 2020 Republican National Convention. And of course, given the passion of our politics, will most likely not be boring. A little later in the dialogue, we welcome John Lassiter, the Chief Executive Officer of Charlotte's 2020 Host Committee. Before that, we begin to unpack the dialogue and the issues in our region, and we will meet our expert panel once again in a moment. Stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Donnie Hicks of the Gaston County EDC, Karen Reardon of the Myrtle Beach Chamber of Commerce, and special guest, John Lassiter, President and CEO of the Charlotte 2020 Host Committee of the RNC. Hello, welcome to our program, Donnie, welcome back. Thank you. Karen, good to see you again. Uh, we were talking right before uh, the lights went up, um, and you spent a lot of time between Myrtle Beach and Columbia. Yes. Um, is there a real indication that Highway 74 is going to be an interstate down to the Grand Strand? We believe that it's still achievable. It's again something the Chamber's been working on for over 28 years. Uh, and really, we, we look at it as a triple layer cake. We know we need to have that local funding and support, working hard to continue to make sure that's secure, working really hard with our federal delegation on the, uh, you know, the federal uh, funding, the infra grants. Uh, but the state piece has not been a piece uh, that has had a lot of attention placed right. on it. And so I've been spending a lot more of my time focused on making sure that the entire state of South Carolina and really understands what the impact of I-73 can be on the state's economy. Yeah, and I know we weren't, uh, yeah, I-73, mm -hmm. I'm sorry you said I-74. Uh, th so the idea, do you feel like you're making your case to DOT or the state house more? Uh, the DOT and the go governor's office are very, mu very much in support. It's really educating a lot of our, our legislators in the other part of the state um, who, again, just really don't understand uh, what I-73 can do. Um, but it is interesting. We just were able to host the freshman caucus recently and uh, be able to talk to those newbies as, as they, they come in. And they really had they no idea. They're very open. They had no yeah. idea that Myrtle Beach remains the only major tourist destination on the East Coast that does not have an interstate feeding it. And they were like, wow. Well, and I know, and, and I promise, Donnie, we're going to give you a mm -hmm. chance to talk about DOT and connectivity. I know that, Karen, but they, and not they, but that's been a dialogue in South Carolina for decades, and everyone agrees mm -hmm. it, but there doesn't seem to be the funding available when it comes down to the 11th hour. Absolutely, and I think that that's why we have to get to the point of understanding that it's going to be a shared responsibility. This is not something that the local municipalities and the county can do on its own. It's not something where the federal government's going to wave a magic wand and they're going to build the interstate, those days are gone. And it's not something that the state can't contribute to where everybody is going to have to do this if we want to have that to keep growing the South mm -hmm. Carolina economy. Uh, Donnie, different kind of connectivity problem, but you probably might as well feel like you're miles away or, mm -hmm. or 
or three hours away. So uh, Gastonia is close to Charlotte on the other side of the Catawba River, but connectivity is a problem, which has stymied growth. Is that fair to say? I think so. We have a large portion of the southern part of the county that is unserved. There's a 12-mile section from 74 all the way into South Carolina. We have no crossing between us and Mecklenburg County. So the whole section of the southern county is cut off. We've uh, tried to work on a bridge across the river over near West Boulevard, and we still hope that someday that will get built. We're also working to get light rail down 74 past the airport and river district into Gaston County. And so we're part of a regional study looking at the feasibility of extending it to Belmont and ultimately to Gastonia. What would you, how, what would you handicap as your best option to make the case around? Light rail. Light rail. Well, I think there's vastly more support for light rail, both politically and financially, to do that. Um, the, the bridge has a lot of opposition from people who live in that area, and it's got a, a history of opposition to it. So I think the light rail is probably the most supported option. This, this, you know, this kind of yin and yang of, well, DOT is important, funding, local DOT is important. Well, wait a minute, education is important. So you've got both in Raleigh and Columbia, these arguments that go back and forth. D Donnie, how, how do you further the idea that local transportation and infrastructure funding might be job one? I think it, it is job one because it's under state control largely. We do have the ability to control the education at the county level if we choose. We can fund it at a higher level almost any time we can given our financial capacity. But we don't have a lot of control over the transportation piece and that's where we need the state's help almost entirely. Uh, the DOT is helping us out immensely. We have half a billion dollars worth of road, and pro road improvement projects now including the widening of I-85 to US 321 and the replacement of every interchange in that section and the widening of 74 and the replacement of the bridges to Mecklenburg County. Oh, that's all you're asking that, for? <laughs> well, we had, those are already funded in addition to several other projects. So that's a benefit to the people that travel through our area, not just the local mm -hmm. economy. But it'll be huge to us to have those road improvements and it'll help with the, through traffic, it'll help with logistics in and around the airport area to allow them to get south and west faster. So infrastructure is a theme that's not lost in the Grand Strand, Horry County, Myrtle Beach, Absolutely. Karen. And I know you uh, all have posted some pretty exceptional growth when it comes to MSA growth in the country. Yes. And it's just hard to believe. Myrtle Beach is the second largest MSA, growing MSA in this country? Yes, after, after another community and county in Utah. Does uh, that give you leverage? not just in Columbia or with the feds, but even locally, can you make a case? And let's talk about downtown mm -hmm. revitalization because mm -hmm. that's been an issue in Myrtle Beach. Yes. Does that give you the, the kind of the leverage and the oomph that you need to get a, down, a, a vibrant downtown, kind of cool center city core going on? We absolutely believe so. We believe that now is the time as we are seeing this influx of folks. One of the most interesting aspects when we dig deep into the data is that the people that are coming, contrary to what people might believe, are not just retirees. We are getting our fair share of retirees that want the the quality lifestyle that is the Myrtle Beach area, but we're getting a lot of people in that prime work age of 35 to 54. And so where the chamber is actually working with economic development on a whole campaign to be talking uh, to the key influencers, to site selectors, uh, to other business prospects about the opportunity to invest, not just because we have these great incentives through opportunity zones, but because we actually are importing the workforce mm -hmm. uh, that they will want uh, and that they need. And so I think that's a really, really new, interesting aspect to the growth. And it is giving us some leverage to be able to talk about that uh, and just further educate people within the state and outside the state about the opportunities that exist in the Grand mm -hmm. Strand. When you hear Karen talking about that, Donnie, and not just for Gastonia or Gaston mm -hmm. County, that's, that's, that's very close and a neighbor of Charlotte and the biggest city in the Carolinas, but when you were head of the Economic Development Association, when you were on top of that volunteer board, um, how does this stuff ring true for you in, in places like Gastonia? So I think there's a lot of opportunity um, with the transportation, the education piece. We have opportunity zones that were implemented recently through federal tax reform. Do they work? They can. I think there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of time for the developers to understand it, the financial institutions to understand mm -hmm. it. But the concept behind it is you can avoid capital gains or defer potential capital gains on previous asset sales. It doesn't have to be a land sale as it would with a traditional tax deferral. It could be from stocks, bonds, sale of whatever. And so I think that uh, has given us a lot of opportunity. The airport is uh, a tremendous asset that we have throughout North Carolina. In Charlotte Douglas. Yeah, it, it draws from through a vast part of the whole region. 
And that is a huge separator for us. And uh, when we compete against our peer groups, say in Nashville, which you look at growth numbers, it's fairly close to us. You mm -hmm. look at the opportunities, the office market absorption, we're neck and neck. But what separates us is the airport access and what we have to offer. So back to that connectivity. Mm -hmm. Connectivity. Karen, you mentioned one thing, we have less than a minute. Uh, you talked about importing talent. Is that a tougher, taller order in a resort like Myrtle Beach when people say, well, yeah, it's, it's a resort. It's not really a place that we want to end up living. And that's probably not fair to say to you, but I want to ask. The well, it, it's a challenge, but I think that the solution is going to be a combination of growing our own talent uh, within the area, as well as uh, the influx of people that are coming in that really are still looking to be working. They want to be part of a vibrant community. Uh, they enjoy, again, the aspects of the beach and the entertainment and the restaurants, uh, but they're not ready to sit on a rocking chair. They're not ready to retire. They still have another 10, maybe 20 years of work, uh, and they want to be doing something that's challenging. So the things happening downtown where we've been able to attract new maker space, uh, new companies. Again, we've just been listed as a new historic district on the register nationally for downtown Myrtle Beach. We have an arts and innovation district. So there's some really, really exciting things happening downtown. Um, and we think it's going to be, again, a combination of existing folks there and new folks moving in to enjoy that lifestyle year round. Uh, that will be the workforce of tomorrow. And you think that that older demographic is untapped potential for jobs. Absolutely. Many of them are captains of industry. They're CEOs, they're general managers uh, back in wherever they were living in the past, whether that was New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and they're flocking to North Carolina and South Carolina. And so this is an, an asset that we mm -hmm. can use just like airports and other connectivity and infrastructure. And we intend to try to really use that as a lever. All right. Thank you. Stay with us, please. Uh, coming up on this program, he is the chief executive officer of, uh, of Food Retail tailored almost giant. I guess you could call him pretty big fresh market. His name is Larry Appel. Larry will join us. Uh, and then also, this is a two-part series we do every year, right around the end of the year and on the beginning of the year. Part one is the economic uh, review of 2019, and part two is the economic forecast. Four of our Resident economists will battle it out, as they <laughs> always do. Very interesting dialogue, and we hope you will join us for that. You know, you might think something as iconic and well-known as a major political party convention would be only political. Well, not according to the organizers in the Charlotte Host Committee. The 2020 Republican National Convention is about economic development and community building as much as a political conclave. Joining us again is the Chief Executive Officer of the Charlotte 2020 Host Committee, John Lasseter. John, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. John, let's, so you, you don't look at this as a political event. Is that no, right? it's an economic development event. It's, it's no different than uh, the um, NBA All-Star Game, the President's Cup, uh, the U.S. Open coming to Pinehurst. Uh, we are a 501c3 economic development organization. Uh, we are prohibited to take political action or make political comment as we carry out our duties. And we've started from the very beginning of taking advantage of all of these eyeballs and attention and visitors uh, to drive our economic development message for city of Charlotte, surrounding region, and the two states. Before we unpack this a little bit further, I want to come back to the idea that you, so Charlotte will host the 2020 Republican National Get Together Convention. They did the DNC in 2012. Correct. So this is uh, a very short list of cities that hosted both conventions within a decade. What does that say about the Queen City, you think? Well, it, it, it points a couple things. We're a very attractive place to host uh, significant convention activity of whatever scale. And it also it means we're kind of in the political play. So it's, it's not lost to anybody that, that North Carolina, which is a purple state, uh, is, is desired by both Republican and Democrats to win uh, the presidency. Same reason that the Democrats have gone to Milwaukee, um, because that state they see as winnable based upon the bump that you can get from uh, the convention and the mobilization of of the activists to help drive the political activity. Tara, mm -hmm. question? I really wanted to understand uh, what you are going to be using as the tools to measure uh, the total economic impact of this event, because I'm, I'm sure that it's a very, very large number, but how do you go about as the host committee measuring what that, that economic impact will look like? Well, there's like? some traditional tools that we'll use. Mm -hmm. So for example, you, you, you measure the indirect and direct spend. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the direct spend will be about, about 100 million indirect about 
80 plus, depending upon mm -hmm. kind of how it all kind of moves through the economy. Um, you count the number of people who are employed, the number of, of businesses who, who uh, get contracts to the vendor system. Um, and, and then you kind of look at, based on your thrust, you do the kind of things you want to do. So we want to mm -hmm. spend local. Mm -hmm. We want to spend a lot of money with um, minority-owned, women-owned, veteran-owned businesses. And we can measure all that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And our vendor system that we have set up um, on our website uh, allows us to do that as soon as somebody says, we want to do business with, with our, um, our host committee. And you see the economic impact being, again, starting now and going all the way through for the next 12 months, even though the event's a concrete thing. Yeah, it's calendar. already started. So we have visitors who are coming almost every week. Somebody's coming here from somewhere to kind of scope out what they want. So they're taking mm -hmm. down hotel rooms, they're doing uh, events. Mm -hmm. We're doing things as we kind of drum up the $71 million that we have to raise. Um, and it will play kind of crescendo mm -hmm. to the week before the convention. The convention is, is August 24 to 27, 2020. But the whole week before, um, media operations mm -hmm. will be here setting up. The convention center will be rebuilt. The Spectrum Arena, where the, where the convention show will be, mm -hmm. all those will be under construction for um, weeks and months leading up to the event. Don. John, I know people think this is a political convention. It, the pol politicians and delegates will show up with the media, but there's also a huge opportunity for us in economic development in the two-state region. And could you talk about the type of people from business that will be here, what opportunities we have? Yeah, so I think, message? you know, we, we don't have the full head count yet, but you'll have representatives from almost every Fortune 500 in town for some period of time. And they'll range from kind of the government affairs folks um, to the C-level crowd. And, and they will be here with their teams. They'll be, they'll be with all the regulators, so all the folks who who regulate their industries, whether it's, it's House and Senate members, whether it's cabinet secretaries. Um, we'll also have ambassadors, about 100 each direction, so both foreign ambassadors coming here and U.S. ambassadors that go to other countries, all focus on foreign direct investment and expansion of their activity. Um, and, and then there's just other folks who just kind of want to be here because it's an important place to be and business is being done. And we're trying to build that platform in a way that, that we make access easy, availability of venues easy, and opportunities for folks who want to talk together. And we, you and I talked before we came on the show. There's, I think, a great place to bring the key site selectors uh, to this community and integrate mm -hmm. them into the, 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 the business development crowd, the, 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 the real estate groups, uh, the expansion activity, and let them see what we have to offer as a way to kind of drive our long-term message. Can, can you use the, the roadmap of DNC 2012 in Charlotte as a roadmap to say, well, that's what happened there, so we can expect at least 180 million benefit plus plus? How do you get to a number? Well, we get there because you've got historical data. So we've, we've looked sure. at, in, in the case of Republicans, uh, Tampa and Cleveland are the last two conventions. And, and we also looked at the, at the DNC um, here. And those numbers mm -hmm. kind of just ratchet up. And you know, the, the good news, bad news is that at, as, as the economy has improved, the ability to find the trade folks you need and, the, and all, it's just gone up. And so, so just the upfit on mm -hmm. facilities is more complicated and more expensive. Mm -hmm. So we've used a relatively conservative number, um, and we've taken numbers that come from CRVA and say this is what we kind of think it will be. We know it will be greater than that. We're already getting calls from, from groups and interests that beyond the 16,000 hotel rooms we have under control, they say, can you find me another 20 because our organization wants to be here and we want to do some events to kind of drive on certain policy mm -hmm. directions. You made mention about the purple nature of North Carolina, and that's a much watched state. You think it'll be the most watched state in next year's election? I don't know. Again, I, I'm, I'm a 501c3 economic development organization, <laughs> yeah. and so I've got my own perspective on what, <coughs> what might happen. But clearly, North Carolina is always in play at a presidential. It has been as flip-flop now a couple times. We've got a, a U.S. Senate race that will be, be watched very carefully. We've got a governor's race watched carefully. So there'll be a lot going on mm -hmm. that kind of draw attention to our state. And, and you know, and, and that's, that's great for us because the 15,000 credential media who'll be here will be, one, paying attention to kind of the, the activities inside this four-day TV show, yeah. but they've got to produce stories every day. And so we've got a, 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 a branding and narrative uh, a communication strategy where we're, we're building 50 stories and they will, they will take people to go look at manufacturing capability, look at our workforce uh, training programs, 
as well as you know where's the best burrito and where do you go where do you mm -hmm. how far is it to get to the mountains and the sea so we'll 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 spin those stories in a way that we can we can drive our messaging and use that as the vehicle uh, to focus on on our underlying mission, which is which is growing our economy. So does an impeachment outcome one way or other matter to you other than it, it'll draw more, it, not put words in your mouth, it'll draw more attention to the big show? Well, I don't know that. I mean, that, I think I think the, the impeachment narrative going on uh, in Washington is is partly political and partly, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but but end of the day, um, we're focused on who the nominee is. And a nominee will be selected in advance of, of our convention. There are primaries that kind of build up to that point. Same issue if you kind of roll back to, to 2016 in Cleveland. They didn't have a nominee until fairly late in the game. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to figure out kind of how all the politics play out. The Democrats have got that problem in Milwaukee. They started late. We got started in June of, of 2018. They got started in January of 2019. Um, and so we've had a lot more time to kind of build our model, hire our team, focus on what we care about. And it's, uh, it's a little indifferent in the sense of whatever the politics play out, they play out. Um, because we're going to hold a convention. It's going to nominate the Republican nominee for president and vice president. But at the end of the day, our success is measured on, on how well did we sell what we have to sell mm -hmm. in our community. Sure. I'm really interested in you talking about economic development, of course, from the Grand Strand area. Hospitality is a major driver there. What do you see are the long-term positive impacts of this Charlotte showcase uh, for tourism for the Carolinas? Yeah, you know, if you go back and look at conventions in the past, they, they really they really came off of the hospitality tourism. That was the mm -hmm. primary focus or in case of Cleveland trying to kind of rebrand themselves because mm -hmm. they go national stage. Uh, so we don't lose track of that, mm -hmm. and and we we have already begun a lot of conversations with tourism partners across mm -hmm. the two states about how do we how do we one promote what you do. And we'll do that with a lot mm -hmm. of the branding activity that takes place in our airport on our light rail system, uh, in 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 wayfinding capacity, and mm -hmm. the brochures we'll hand out to everybody. But but there are folks who don't know much about where they are, mm -hmm. and this is their first experience or their only experience is they they flew through and changed planes in Charlotte Douglas, uh, Douglas Airport. So this is a way to kind of explain, you know, here's here's what's happening here. Here's here's the beach structure. Here's how you get there. Here's the places for different times of the year. And again, you know, almost half of the of the media will come from not just out of market but out of the country. Mm -hmm. And, and many of them have no perspective about where they are. And so we get a chance to kind of say, here's where you are on the map, here's what you can get to, here's where our mountains are, here's where our beaches are, here's where the golf courses are, here's, here's where the outdoor activities can be. And that benefits everybody mm -hmm. because every time you draw somebody and whether they come for business or tourism, it's that first chance to kind of see your community and you want to be able to kind of get as much mm -hmm. as you can in that first impression. So, so, John, I had the benefit of hearing you speak to the Economic Development Group, which I'm part of. And one thing I was struck by when you think about the economic impact is some of the infrastructure that gets built to support mm -hmm. this that stays behind that we get the benefit of, and even some of the potential charity pieces that come out of this at the end. Yeah, so there's a, there's a $50 million federal security grant that's now been approved by the House and Senate, and that goes primarily to law enforcement. It's administered by, by the, the Chief of Police in Charlotte, Mecklenburg Police Department. They do that in conjunction with... Um, uh, the FBI, the Secret Service, Homeland Security, Capitol Police, and we have the benefit of what kind of what that means for a community in 12. And so we 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 got um, we got mobile command center, we got facial recognition software that's mm -hmm. on hanging on all the light poles, and that all stays behind. There'll be similar things that occur this time as well. We also have built into our model a a way to have a lasting impact, and we've already. Um, um, I think I'm getting too ahead of myself. We've already identified some things we want to do, one of which we plan to plant 2,020 trees in Charlotte um, during 2020. Um, it's a little corny, but it's a, if it, you talk about a city of trees and, and you're able to kind of do that in a way that benefits areas in town that don't have as much tree cover, get those in the ground, and we're going to try to bring people with differing views together to help make that happen. We got some other projects that deal with education, deal with veterans, and so we budgeted in our model a way to kind of have some impact that transcends just the week of the convention, 
and people look back and say, that really was great this happened because look at the things that it benefited while they were here. Um, we, literally 30 seconds left. W were you, are you encouraged, even though Charlotte has tacked it left on, on politics, do you get a sense that, that city council, county commission, mayor's office are all in? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it, you get caught up in trying to get things passed, and you know, the mayor has been absolutely steadfast in her support. Uh, she went to Austin to get the bid. She worked with Senator Tillis to make the original, original presentation. Um, and, and she's provided enormous leadership, okay. and we're relying on that. And I think council recognizes this is a terrific opportunity okay. for our city. Uh, last, that's it. Thank you, John. Good luck, and thanks for leading the effort. Good to see you. <laughs> Donnie, Thank you. Kira. Thank you, Chris. See you. Take care. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.